This is Dr. Sharice Flanagan from Abilene Christian U University. Today we'll be talking about personality testing. First of all, let's talk about what is personality. Personality at a definitional level includes two main features. It is stable, meaning that the traits and patterns that people demonstrate through their personality arise repeatedly. This is uh, largely true from about age three. Some personality traits can be seen even sooner. Now we can certainly learn new skills, we can have things that inhibit our personality or uh, places where we feel more comfortable, but in general our personality is stable. So if you are fairly laid back and, and uh, relaxed kind of as a baby, as a kid, you may still have that same laid back kind of personality. Uh, if you were a little bit neurotic, if you tended to get tense, we may have even been able to see some of those things from birth. We could have seen some higher levels of cortisol in your saliva, for example. And uh, that more tense kind of trait may persist throughout your life. Personality is also distinctive. And I just want you to, to give thought to this as we begin talking about measuring personality I want you to recognize and understand that our personalities are distinctive from one another. We are all different. That's one of the things that's so fascinating about people. However, today we're going to talk about similarities within people and how we can go about measuring those things to understand uh, personality traits better. So for example, I want you to give some thought to several different uh, reactions to getting a B plus on a paper. There are people who would uh, be devastated to see this mark on their paper. They would be um, shocked and scared and frustrated and sad and mad that they had a B plus instead of an A plus. Uh, on the other hand, there are people who would be thrilled to get a B plus. They'd be like, yes, I passed uh, with flying colors. And this isn't just a matter of being a good student or a bad student. It's just our approach uh, and the way we react to such information. So personality testing, uh, tests in general, are used to measure personality. And we have literally hundreds of tests available for this purpose. We're going to talk about two of them today. Um, so just skimming the surface of the kinds of tools that we have at our access. Um, but at the root of this is how do we understand people and how do we measure how can we come to measure them? There are two different ways to do that. There are objective tests and there are projective tests that are um, two, of the, two of the types of, of testing that we use in psychology. Objective tests are clear, unambiguous questions, uh, and you're very familiar with these. They just ask you a question and you answer yes or no or strongly agree to strongly disagree. Projective tests are different. They're ambiguous. They have unclear stimuli, and the test taker is asked to impose meaning on maybe a picture or uh, to tell a story about something, and then it's the psychologist's job to interpret that. So here's some examples of, of the most commonly used objective and projective tests. Objective tests, the MMPI-2. This is the granddaddy of all personality tests. The Milan Clinical Multi-Axle Inventory. We also call this, some people call it the Milan, some people call it the MCMI. The Milan is used primarily in uh, psychiatric uh, environments. So you don't use this for normal pathology, normal uh, populations. It tends to over-pathologize. The NEO, though, is built on the five-factor model. We're going to look at that today. And that one is appropriate for use across all kinds of different populations. And then we've got a couple of um, symptom inventories you'll notice. The Beck Depression Inventory, the Beck Anxiety Inventory, also commonly referred to as the BDI and the BAI, or the Becks. There's also a hopelessness inventory that's used a lot. So I want you to think for a minute that the terminology that we use for these tests may not be as accurate as we'd like. We're calling it a personality test, but some of these you can see, they're really symptom inventories. They're clinical inventories. So I wish that we 
would call this something different besides personality tests, but this is in the category of personality testing. So the Myers-Briggs we've um, discussed already, and that is a test that's widely used in organizations and corporations and also among psychologists. It tests uh, normal populations. And the 16PF is also another one that's used in normal uh, populations, across all populations. Projective tests are different. You have less experience with these. These are like the Rorschach inkblot test, um, the thematic apperception test, which is a storytelling test, the house tree person is a drawing test, and sentence completion, which is a type of test where you give someone a sentence stem, such as my mother, and then let them fill in the blank, and then you interpret the, the responses of a list of you know, 35 some odd questions like that. Okay, let's talk about projectives a little bit more. The projective hypothesis is basically based on psychodynamic theory. And the idea here is that the way we interpret ambiguous stimuli, so like that ink blot you just looked at, that that reflects our unconscious needs, motives, and conflicts. Now think about Freud and his um, iceberg. Think about the unconscious needs. So we're going to reveal aspects of our personality, aspects of our self, our psyche, through the way we interpret and react to these ambiguous stimuli. Uh, one of the strengths of this is that it's really hard to fake on this, where you could ask me if I'm depressed or if I'm angry, and I could say yes or no, and I may or may not be telling you the truth. But projectives are built on this idea that you really can't hide. You and so there's less temptation to fake because you really don't know what it is that's being measured. Uh, another strength is that it doesn't depend as much on verbal abilities. You can do it whether you read or not, um, or whether if you're, you're lower verbal functioning. So it can tap into both conscious and unconscious traits. Think for a minute that if you were looking, I'm going to flip back really quickly to this slide right here. If you're looking at this ink blot and I say, what might this be? Well... You might see something that you feel like is inappropriate to mention. And so you could screen that out. So there is a certain amount of um, conscious reactions because you may not want to tell me that, um, you know, some negative, angry, dark, sexual kind of reaction that you have to this. Um, so, so there is a, a part of that. Um, so the focus with the projective test is that they are looking for clinical um, clinical traits there. So not normal behavior, but, um, but really for psychopathology. Uh, they were not originally developed with norms. Like the MMPI, we gave to thousands of people and we got norms and objective standardized kind of data that, that helped us understand whether someone was in a normal range or high or low. Uh, that is not the way projectives were, were built. They were much more... Um, uh, intuitive in the way the theories were developed. But over time, we have developed norms and standardized ways of reacting and measuring and interpreting projective tests. So one thing I want you to think about is that projective tests do not have the same psychometric sturdiness. Uh, what does that mean? It means they have lower reliability and lower validity than most of your personality tests. Uh, in spite of this, they continue to enjoy widespread use. So don't misunderstand me. I did not just say they're invalid or that they have unacceptable reliability. I did not say that. I said they were lower, um, lower than your objective tests like the MMPI or the NEO. Uh, but in spite of that, we, we still continue to use them. Five of the top 15 tests, I'm going to go back to this slide right here. You look over here. Uh, here's four of them. I'm, I don't remember what the fifth one was, but uh, all of these tests are widely, widely used. And the Rorschach, for example, is expensive. Uh, not, not because the cards are expensive, but because it takes a lot of time for the psychologist to interpret and score and write that up. Okay, so I want to switch gears here to the five-factor model. Uh, I'm going to talk about two different 
uh, personality tests, and I'm beginning to talk about the first one now. So the five-factor model is the leading theory of personality today. Uh, it's built on the idea that understanding psycho psychopathology, so symptoms, on a, a continuum from normal to abnormal. So for example, it's normal for us to experience a certain amount of stress. If you're in school, if you're working, if you're raising children, there's going to be a normal level of anxiety. Uh, we can also measure, once we know kind of what's normal, think about the normal curve, uh, then you know what's high and what's low. Because there's some people who are so laid back, they so lack the response of anxiety that they may not even, for example, care if they bathe because they just don't care that much about what people think or, or so forth. So that's kind of an extreme example. But um, some people have such low anxiety that they can't get stuff done. Um, all right. So as we moved into the DSM-5, which you'll learn more about in uh, abnormal psychology, uh, we, we've moved to this five-factor model a bit. This image is just depicting the continuum. So the NEO PF, um, there's several versions of the NEO. The NEO PIR is actually one that I use the most, uh, is built on the five-factor model. So it has a theoretical orientation. That's important to remember because when I talk about the MMPI, I'm going to tell you the MMPI was not designed, it was not created based on any one theory. It was developed through statistical means um, in uh, factor, uh, factor analysis. So the NEO has these five factors, and you most often see the acronym for this uh, as OCEAN. Okay, The O is for openness. And people who are have an openness, who measure high on this, have an appreciation of art and literature and music, they may have an openness to emotion, if you will. They like to do adventurous things. They are curious about new ideas and new values. And so they might uh, really be interested in talking to someone of a different religion and inquiring, what, what is it about that that you believe? And tell me more about that. Um, so they like this openness to experience. They like to try new foods and, and listen to new music. Conscientiousness, uh, the C is for conscientiousness. This is exactly what it says it is. These are people who are very self-disciplined. They're dutiful. They are planned in their approach to their day and to their tasks. They're orderly. Extroversion measures whether people high on this would be extroverted. They would have lots of positive emotions, high energy, and they like to be around other people. People low on the extroversion scale are going to be introverted. They like to spend time by themselves or a trusted other person. They prefer a few relationships over a bunch. And in general, they get their energy from being by themselves. They have to have that time by themselves because even if they're extroverted, that, that may wear them out a little bit to be with people all day. A is for agreeableness. This is the tendency to be compassionate and cooperative, um, and the opposite of that is suspicious and antagonistic, just generally a little more disagreeable. And the neuroticism scale is a really important one, this, this feature, and it includes a lot of different things, such as anger, anxiety, depression, emotional vulnerability. Um, so you imagine that um, these things sometimes cluster together. I'm, I sometimes say anxiety and depression are best friends. They often uh, really reinforce each other, and you see them often. So the research we have in personality suggests that uh, some of these more negative, angsty emotions can be grouped together into this thing called neuroticism and just a, more of a tendency to experience unpleasant emotions. People very low on neuroticism um, just don't, experience emotion quite as um, they they have more positive emotions all right so they pay less attention to their to their more unpleasant emotions okay let's look quickly just at a neo profile just to give you a sense of of what one might look like you see over here on the left are the main 
what we call domains. So you've got your neuroticism scale, extroversion, openness, agreeableness, and conscientiousness. All these are in the average range. So there's not a lot of interest in this particular profile. Uh, but within each one, so these are the neuroticism facets. All of these words down here are what we call facets. I'm not going to have you, you don't need to know these. I just want to show you. So the, the neuroticism facets are anxiety, anger, depression, self-consciousness, and impulsiveness and vulnerability. Extroversion is next. And these are warmth, gregariousness, assertiveness, activity. Uh, they really just have this one elevation into a high range here. It's aesthetics. So this could have been, well, I don't even know what this dotted line was. But the point is, I just wanted to see you, to see this plotted out to see what kind of data a psychiatrist might be looking at. And I think just because I don't, that one's so plain, let me look um, quickly at, like here's one that's uh, very, um, it's got lots and lots of elevation. So we can quickly look over here into the very high range. We've got anger, impulsiveness, assertiveness, excitement seeking, actions. So I don't know what, I don't know whose this was and I would need to look at their history to make a determination. But even though they're overall, they're facet, at the facet level, there isn't anything in the very high range. Um, or at the domain level, their facets are really, really interesting. Um, so you've got all of these big spikes and low dips. So let's see what's very, very low. Self-consciousness. Uh, gregariousness. This person's scaring me. Low, low, and feelings. This looks like a psychopath to me. And dutifulness. Yeah, I'm sure this, to me, this this looks like probably an example of a criminal profile. This this looks like someone who is probably incarcerated. Um, so that's just my best guess. That concludes um, the, the first part of the personality talk. I'm going to stop here and just kind of remind you in brief that we talked about um, objective and projective tests, uh, objective tests being um, the personality tests like we talked about the NEO today. I'm going to do another segment on the MMPI and these are in contrast to projective techniques which we did not talk about in length but I did show you the, the slide that had the, uh, the most commonly used projective tests like the Rorschach and the TAT.